The Bible's loaded with repetitious prayer. Psalm 136. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. It goes on for 23 more verses just like that. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, Matthew 26, comes down from praying and sweating blood to find the apostles asleep. And it says in verse 44, after leaving them, he went away and prayed for a third time, saying, the same words. I'm pretty sure that Jesus' repetition in that prayer was not vain. And then you got the four living creatures in the book of Revelation, chapter 4, who never stop ceasing day and night, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Should the four living creatures be kicked out of heaven for violating a clear command of Jesus? <laughs> Well, hello and welcome to another Not Too Proud to Beg episode of On the Journey with Matt and Ken and Kenny. And we've been going through our series on the Blessed Virgin Mary, what we used to think about her as Protestants. Uh, We come from Baptist and Pentecostal and Wesleyan backgrounds, all of us together, and how we came to be convinced of the Catholic case for, uh, well, the way that the church talks about Mary. We'll get into a lot of that today in a kind of a lightning round format uh, and wrap up a whole bunch of different questions that have been sort of laying out there. But first, want to remind people that the Coming Home Network is there for you if you are in the midst of these questions. Visit us at chnetwork.org, especially if you're a pastor like Ken was and like Kenny was and are looking for assistance. Uh, we can even help you, um, you know, get to a retreat where you can meet other people in your same situation. And uh, we would love to help you if that's you. You can also join our online community, which we all hang out in and talk about stuff with each other in. That's community.chnetwork.org. And again, all this is free to our viewers, and our goal is to make as much of our stuff free as possible to people. So if you want to make that uh, the case in perpetuity, go visit chnetwork.org slash donate. All right, Ken Hensley, Kenny Burchard, are you ready? I've been I've been warming up in the mirror, uh, <laughs> you know, running flights of stairs, doing jumping jacks, because this is going to be a wild one. Well, you know, yeah. I... I'm not sure if you can refer to this as a lightning round when we're going to work through seven questions, probably spending five or six or seven minutes on each one. Well, compared yeah. to spending an hour on one question, it is a lightning true. round. True. Yeah, yeah, that's true. true. Relative. So Time I'm, is relative. Talk to Einstein I'm, about it. I'm looking forward to it, guys. Really, really. Well, time okay. is relative and Mary is Jesus is relative, and that's part of the <laughs> conversation here. Again, this is all Mary stuff. Yeah. We're going to go through a series of questions. Again, these have come up. In passing from people who are like, when are you going to address this? When are you going to address this? And so on and so forth. So uh, seven of these questions, I'm going to take the first one, and then I'm going to wind you all up for the rest of them. But the first question, uh, one of the first questions that comes up is, all right, let's talk about the rosary. Vain repetition, the Hail Mary prayers 10 times in a row, the rosary and seems to invoke Mary more than Jesus. What is going on here? So I was trying to figure out how to best answer this question. I went down 500 rabbit holes. I'm going to distill this down a little bit. We're going to start with the question of uh, the vain repetition part. I'll get to the Mary part of it in a second. So vain repetitions, where does this idea of the rosary being vain repetitions and that being a bad thing come from? Well, it comes from Jesus, right? Matthew chapter 6, verse 7, Jesus says, When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, that they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Uh, empty phrases, vain repetitions, you see in some translations. So uh, if we want to know what Jesus means by that, we got to figure out who's heaping up the vain repetitions. What are these vain repetitions they are heaping up? To find that out, you got to back up a verse because Jesus is actually saying a couple different things about prayer in this passage. Uh, in verse six, right before this, he says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen. He's talking about an attitude of prayer where people are just praying to draw attention to themselves. And who's he addressing in this situation? The Jewish religious leaders. Then in verse 7, one verse later, he says, When you're praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. He's talking about a different kind of error in prayer. 
They think they'll be heard because of their many words. Now, to address this, I could give you my thoughts. I'm just going to read from a commentary, which sums it up a lot better than I could. Um, and this commentary, it's an introduction to uh, the Gospel of Matthew. It says this. This saying of Jesus the, about the vain repetitions is aimed not against the hypocrites in this case, but against praying as the Gentiles do. Prayer in the non-Jewish world was often characterized particularly by formal invocations and magic incantations in which the correct repetition counted rather than the worshiper's attitude or intention. And just in case you think I stole that from some Catholic commentary that's putting the Romish spin on it, that's from uh, Volume 1 of the Tyndale New Testament Commentaries published by InterVarsity Press. So, there's that. Second of all, a lot of people object to the rosary, don't know how it actually works. Uh, it's important to note that in the rosary, a typical rosary, you got five events from the life of Christ, known as the mysteries. Mm -hmm. You take an event one at a time, you pray ten Hail Marys while you think about that event. That's an oversimplification, but that's the basic gist of it. So you're trying to absorb an event in the life of Christ as you pray these ten Hail Marys. Now, there may be Catholics who repeat that vainly or just keep in count, and that's the only thing that they're doing in the course of praying the rosary, but that's not what the church is inviting us to. It's inviting us to marinate in these events of the life of Christ. So an example from my own life about the difference between the vain repetition and what the church is calling us to, at least I hope. Uh, I hope my example is good. But I pray the rosary most of the time in the middle of the night. I got a one I got one hanging on my bedpost. I wake up, can't be, get back to sleep. Rather than marinate in the anxieties of the world, I choose to pick an event from the life of Christ and try and absorb it into my mind and heart, and I pray the ten Hail Marys through the course of it to try and focus it. Now, let's say I, I do as I normally do, and I fall asleep in the middle of this thing. Do you think Mary's up in heaven saying, you know, I was going to tell my son to help this guy out, but he he went dark on uh, Hail Mary number six of decade number three. He He's on his own. He's on his own here. No, of course not, right? Because that's not what the rosary is about, and that's not how Catholics use it. Two more quick points here. One more quick point in regard to vain repetition is that the Bible's loaded with repetitious prayer. Psalm 136, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. It goes on for 23 more verses just like that. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, Matthew 26, comes down from praying and sweating blood to find the apostles asleep. And it says in verse 44, after leaving them, he went away and prayed for a third time, saying the same words. I'm pretty sure that Jesus' repetition in that prayer was not vain. And then you got the four living creatures in the book of Revelation, chapter 4, who never stop ceasing day and night, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Should the four living creatures be kicked out of heaven for violating a clear command of Jesus? <laughs> Last thought. No. Last thought is this. I was marinated, and I'm using the word marinate a lot, because I feel like marination and meditation have a lot in common. But I spent a lot of time in the 90s in Bible college going to praise nights and stuff, and they'd be singing this song called I Could Sing of Your Love Forever, the chorus of which goes, I could sing of your love forever four times. That's the chorus. And then you sing the chorus like 10 times, right? <laughs> uh, now, was this vain repetition? I imagine for some people it was, but there were a lot of people in that room singing that song who were doing this as a way of reflecting on those words, reflecting on that idea, thinking about what it will one day be like to be up there with those four living creatures who never stop singing of God's love forever, day and night. Um, and then finally, in reference to the, the whole thing about why are we talking about Mary so much in the rosary more than Jesus? Well, the rosary is meant to help us walk alongside Mary through the life of Christ. We're saying to her, you know him better than anyone. You were there when this stuff happened. Show us what you saw. So I cut out like 12 minutes of stuff there, guys. I, I don't, <laughs> no I don't way. know. Yeah. There's more. There's more. You know, Matt, I, I'll jump in here and, uh, and then Ken can share some things too. And I really like what you did there. You know, I remember, um, Hearing one of my pastor friends critique the praying of the rosary on the basis of the charge of Jesus regarding vain repetitions. And I just thought, 
you know, what we're saying when we do the Hail Mary prayer is, is we're quoting scripture. <laughs> uh, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. That's the scriptural part. And then the invocation or the request for Mary's intercession is the second part. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. So I have to step back and say, am I repeating a phrase that has no meaning? Because that, that's really the, 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 un, the meaning of the word vain in mm -hmm. the New Testament where Jesus used it means devoid of meaning or devoid of substance. And this would be, when you think of Gentile prayer, you can think of someone sitting there going, Aum, Aum. You know, that, that, there's, a, there's a devoid kind of sounding off of some kind of mantra. This is a word uh, that really means you're saying a phrase over and over again that's supposed to focus you. Well, the prayers that are prayed on the rosary are not devoid of meaning because they're filled with references to Scripture. So that would be my main sort of rejoinder <laughs> retort to the charge that a Catholic who's praying the Hail Mary prayer is praying a vain repetition. Well, and again, the, the vanity and the attitude and the repetition is a big part of this. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, the Gentile prayers were invoked to false gods, and, and Jesus is highlighting that too. You could exactly. pray anything the wrong way. You could pray. Did Jesus mm -hmm. say about the synagogues, uh, the people praying in the synagogues to be seen? He said, they should just stop praying altogether. Right. No, he didn't. <laughs> he said, "This is they're doing this the wrong way. They're doing this right. the wrong way. Ken, you had something to add or no? No, no. I think you guys have covered it pretty well. All right. In that case, I'm going to ask about the one that really freaks me out. I don't want to touch with a 10-foot pole, so one of you can. And that is, <laughs> what about this thing where we're like, you know, I want to know, know more about Christ and his relationship with Mary and what the church teaches. And then some person corners you after mass and says, you need to do the total consecration to Jesus through Mary. Now, here's a book, right? I don't know if anybody had that experience. I've had that experience. Um, how do we handle this one? Okay. I'll jump in and I have three or four thoughts here, Matt, uh, because I, I saw this question as we were writing up the document and I just tell, tell the viewers here that before I ever was Catholic, but I knew I needed to investigate the Catholic faith, I went to a local Catholic bookstore about seven miles from me here in Virginia Beach. I walked in and I told the lady there uh, working at the store, the owner, I said, I believe I'm sensing the Holy Spirit calling me to investigate Catholicism and can you help me with some books? Well, there was a man in the store uh, walking around, looking around at books, and he was listening to our conversation. And then he walked over to me with this book right here. It's called <laughs> 33 Days to Morning Glory. And on the bottom, it says, a do-it-yourself retreat in preparation for Marian consecration. And then he handed me this black plastic rosary. That These particular one, items. you kept it? This one. I keep it behind my, my desk. I hang it by my head. He hands me these two books, and I had no idea what he was talking about. I had zero background in this at all. And he shoves a rosary in one hand and a book in the other, and they're both, you know, I'm looking at him going, well, I know this is all about Mary, and uh, this looks like it's all about Mary. And I, and so in my mind, I started to get really concerned. Like, And then he, and then he said... It's if you get Mary, you'll get, you know, you'll get everything. And I'm just going, oh, man, um, what? <laughs> so my initial um, uh, engagement with this question that you just asked, Matt, was that I was taken aback by it. I was caught sideways by it. And I was very concerned by it. And I'll tell you, I didn't like the language of total consecration to Jesus through Mary. It just sounded, I, I was importing into that phrase all kinds of uh, baggage from my days as a non-Catholic Protestant Christian. And so the book sat on my shelf for over a year. I didn't read it. And then a couple of years ago, I went through it. And I will tell everyone watching now that I have gone through this retreat and I have consecrated myself to Jesus through Mary. <gasps> Uh-oh. So now, now what do I mean by that as someone who's now become a Catholic? Well, let me give a couple of corollaries here. Matt, you always identify yourself on these recordings as a former what? Uh, in, in tradition. 
Are you asking me if I consecrated myself to Jesus through Wesley? <laughs> you always say, I was a Wesleyan. In other words, when you talk about your former engagement with your Christian faith, you include the name of another human being as a way to capture how you were approaching your Christian faith. That person's name has become connected in deep ways to an entire tradition of being a Christian. Again, down the street from me here in Virginia Beach is Virginia Wesleyan University, and you can go on the campus there and stand in front of a, a statue of John Wesley. It was a university uh, founded around his uh, name and his values, and in fact, an entire approach to Christianity called Methodism. This is a method for um, sanctification and living in holiness. It is the Wesleyan um, method for, mm. or or let's say this way, Wesley's method for walking in personal holiness. Uh, an entire Christian denomination is born out of this approach to following Jesus through John Wesley's approach. Um, you could say you were consecrated to Jesus in the way that John Wesley taught one ought to be. When we say consecration to Jesus through Mary. That does not mean <laughs> that I can't have a relationship with Jesus and be saved without Mary between me and Jesus. Rather, it means I'm learning to follow Jesus through the mentoring example, the guidance, the lessons, the engagement with what I can know about Mary, just as I would through any other hero of the faith. It's simply Catholic language that incorporates spirituality, discipleship, um, and those conse those uh, connected phrases. Just one more thought here, and then I'm going to stop for a minute. The consecration to Jesus is about consecration to Jesus. <laughs> That's number one. Through Mary, that second phrase, is language about spiritual direction. It's language about mentoring. It's language about guidance. It's language about example and influence. It is not, as we said in the last episode, about salvific mediation, salvation. And if that meaning were attached to it, then that would be anti-Catholic teaching because the Catholic Church and the Scripture teaches that there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So when we say... I've consecrated my life to Jesus through Mary. Here's the easiest pill to swallow if you're a Protestant. Listen to this. All we mean by that is Mary is my mentor. Uh, Marian um, engagement in my spiritual growth. I'm learning from Mary. Let me stop. All right. Ken, you want to have anything to add to that? I have one quick thought. No. No, you've covered it so well. I, in fact, it leads to the next question we're going to deal with. Mary is mediatrix. So yeah, I you go ahead I if you want to throw something quick. in, Matt. Yeah, the, the one thing is I say, drop a pin and text me where that John Wesley statue is in your town so I can go down there and uh, make a little, yeah. get a little, go, go worship, a little selfie. Go worship John Wesley. A little selfie. No, yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> the only thing I would say is that, boy, you were really man-centered in your life. That's what, that's all I can say, Kenny. I mean, for me, it was only John Calvin and Jonathan Edwards. I only had two, not the six or seven or 10 that you brought up. Thousands that you just named, right? <laughs> but the other thing I was going to point out real quick is that about both of these things we just talked to in the first questions. Um, so the rosary, total consecration of Jesus through Mary. Mm -hmm. You can be a Catholic who is like top of the heap, first in line of the communion of saints, never having done either one of those things. Those are not requirements of the church. Those are devotional practices that the church offers to us uh, as tools in a toolkit. If we mm -hmm. think that they will help us, uh, then we are uh, mm -hmm. told that they are worthy of exploration in our lives. But this other thing is something that we, well, I'll just let you explain it, Ken. There's some freaky language out there that scares the the willies out of yeah. Protestants, and that is Mary mediatrix of all graces or Mary co-redemptrix. What in the world is meant when Catholics start using that kind of language? Well, it, okay, what we're doing here today is we're answering some frequently asked questions. And so the question about the rosary, I think you answered that well. The question about consecration to Jesus through Mary, I think you did an excellent job as well, Kenny. 
So this is another one we need to deal with because people will ask, what is the deal with this Mary being the mediatrix of all graces? After all, as you said a moment ago, Kenny, there's one mediator between God and man, and it's not Mary. It's the man, right. Christ Jesus. So let me work through this. First thing I want to say is that this is not a dogma of the church to say that Mary is mediatrix of all graces. And that's why we didn't cover it as we were walking through the various dogmas in this series that we've done on Mary. Having said that, though, the idea of Mary as a mediatrix of grace, this is something that I will say, I'll stick my neck out and say, understood properly should not be a problem to Catholics. In fact, should not be a problem to Protestants. Yes, there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus shed blood, Jesus' sacrificial death. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus Christ, sacrificial death, is the sole meritorious cause of our salvation and all the graces that flow from that. And I want to be I want to be clear on that. The sole meritorious cause. On the other hand, there are still a number of instrumental causes of our salvation. Uh, let me illustrate first what I mean by, or, or the difference between meritorious cause and an instrumental cause. Okay, imagine you're a filthy teenager. You're a filthy teenage boy. You've been out <laughs> skateboarding all day long. You come home and your mom says, take a shower. So you're going to go in and take a shower. Okay, what is the meritorious cause of you being able to take a shower and get clean and get all that sweat off your body? Well, the meritorious cause would be your mom and dad who earned the money and bought the house and bought a house with a bathroom in it and within the bathroom, a shower. You have nothing except because of them, except by them. They are the, the meritorious cause of you being able to take a shower. But then there are instrumental causes still. That is, you still have to walk into the bathroom. You still have to open the shower door. You have to step in. You have to turn the knob and you know to get the water running. You have to pick up the shampoo and the soap. You have to. These are all instrumental causes. Your parents don't. I mean, unless you're a very weird child, your parents don't walk in and you know get the soap and turn on the water and all that for you. At least not when you're a teenager. So. Meritorious cause is your parents who bought the house and bought the shower and it's all provided for you. The shampoo provided, the soap provided, but there's an instrumental cause. You have to turn the knob to turn on the water to take your shower. By turning on the knob, you're not earning your shower. <laughs> you know, you're not, nothing like that, but still you have to do it. You have to do it. Okay. In a similar way, when I was a pastor um, back before uh, many moons ago, Although I understood, and I understood clearly, you guys, that Jesus was the ultimate cause of salvation. There was no doubt about that. Jesus did not come into my church and step up to the pulpit every Sunday morning and deliver the sermon. Right. I did. You know, I'm the one who opened the Bible and read it in front of the people and preached it and invited people to come forward and receive Christ as personal Savior, which is the way we would talk about it back then. So you could say that I was working with Christ or I was working in Christ. And it's the same when we lead a Christian life, when we try to provide good example, moral example in our lives to others, when we pray for others, when we evangelize others, when we perform corporate spiritual works of mercy. In all of these ways, you and I, all Christians, we are functioning as instrumental causes of salvation. Jesus is the sole meritorious cause, but we are functioning as instrumental causes. We are, as I said last week, extensions, if you will, of the incarnation. We become as his body, his mystical body, his hands, his feet, his voice in this world. Now, there is a sense in which we are all co-redeemers. And I remember a friend one time, a Protestant friend riding in a car with me, he said, yeah, what's the stuff about Mary being a co-redeemer. And I looked at him, I said, well, in a sense, we're all co-redeemers. And he, he just started to laugh. He didn't expect me to go there. But in the sense I'm describing here, <coughs> oh, excuse me, in the sense I'm describing here, we are all co-redeemers because we all cooperate with Christ as instrumental causes of salvation in the work of redemption. And for those who are very Calvinistic and, you know, monergism, you know, synergism, evil of the devil, 
Those who balk at the very idea of us cooperating with Christ, I just want to remind you that Paul himself said in 2 Corinthians 5.20 and 6.1 this, So we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. <laughs> okay, there's your instrumental cause. God making his appeal through us. We, we beseech you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And then chapter 6, verse 1, working together with him, that's what Paul said, that he was a co-worker, working together with him, that is Christ, we entreat you not to accept the grace of God in vain. And okay, all of this, as I kind of wind this up, all of this is to say that there, there is no confusion in Catholic teaching about who is the sole meritorious cause of all the graces that flow to us from the cross the death, the resurrection of Christ in the new covenant. There's no confusion whatsoever. It is Jesus who offered himself up for the sins of the world. As John the Baptist said, he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But there are instrumental causes as well. And at the head of the line, we would have to say, is Mary, who said yes to God and became, I mean, literally became the channel through which the incarnate Son of God, came into the world in order that he might be the Lamb of God and take away the sins of the world. It's in this sense that Mary is co-redemptrix of all graces. Now, just one more point. People respond neg negatively when they hear the word co-redemptrix um, because it sounds like maybe the church is saying that Mary is equal to Jesus. You know, Jesus is the Redeemer. Mary is the co-redemptrix. You, you mean they're even? You mean they're equal? And so I, I just want to point out the prefix co in co-worker or co-redemptor, co-redemptrix, it comes from the Latin cum, C-U-M, which just means with. Gabriel comes to Mary. She responds, be it done unto me. In that sense, she cooperates in the redemption of the world. And that's how I answer this question. So good, Ken. the The language of through comes, you know, comes in there. Matt, you you go first. I have a couple of thoughts too, but you got your. Yeah, I have you two quick something. thoughts. One on just that idea of co workers, right? Uh, in in mm -hmm. the redemption, um, you and I, Ken and Kenny. Yep, we are co workers. We're also co workers with Marcus Grodi, but we're not co workers <laughs> with Marcus Grodi in the same way that we're co workers with each other, right? He's the founder right. of this feast, right? He's the founder and president. He's the one who set this whole thing into motion. We are co workers with him, but it's not some senses which we're like all founders and presidents, right? Co doesn't always mean the same thing, mm -hmm. even in that context. The second thing is this question of instrumental causes and, and how we refer to Mary applies to a whole bunch of different titles uh, that might be confusing to a non-Catholic who's trying to wrap their mind around this. Like, so for instance, and I think it's the litany, litany of Loretto, Mary's referred to as the gate of heaven. Well, that sounds like a bit much, right? That sounds like a little over the top until you think about, well, what does yeah. that mean? Jesus is the word became flesh. He walked through a, a door to do it. Mary was the door. <laughs> She's the gate that mm -hmm. Jesus chose to use to come from heaven as the eternal second person of the Trinity to take on flesh. It's not more complicated than that. It doesn't right. mean that, you know, some some elevated thing that the church is not. I mean, it, there's a there's a practical sense to these mm -hmm. things. It's not just some like crazy title that we made up because we're engaged in some sort of worship towards Mary. Right. Yeah. yeah. Amen. And I, I would um, the way I would approach this. I I just love Ken your your whole um, unpacking there and Matt everything you shared as well. And I always, in these episodes, I find myself wanting to talk to pre-Catholic Kenny. And that's really the way that I want to do all, all of these, because I don't want anyone to think I'm attacking them at all, or even that I'm attacking myself, but rather I want to exhort my pre-Catholic self with some of the mindsets that I had. Uh, let me just, for example, take the language of vessel. We Pentecostals regularly would say, oh, make me a vessel, Lord. There would be whole <laughs> gospel songs written that way. Um, I want to be an... In I remember going to Promise Keepers where we were all saying, make me an instrument of peace, you know, from the St. Francis yeah. prayer. And we just thought that was the most normal thing in the world to pray and ask God to make us a vessel. 
Well, what's a vessel? A vessel is something that contains, you know, in, in our in our faith, it's something that contains grace that God pours out on other people. Were we asking God to, you know, um, take the place of Jesus in our lives, replace Jesus with us and make me the vessel? No. What we were saying yeah. is that we want to par participate in the work of God in the world in a very real and substantive way. Well, Catholic ecclesiology embraces the reality that that's what happens and that it first begins to happen in the life of a young girl, <laughs> you know, in a small town who, um, who said, I'll be the vessel, you know, through mm -hmm. which Jesus comes into the world. And so the church just recognizes that it shouldn't be strange at all for us then to think of mm -hmm. Mary as a vessel. We Pentecostals, pre, pre Catholic Kenny, after all, we're always praying that God would do that with our lives, right? And let me end with my thought in reflection to what you shared, Ken, with a quote from the book that I wanted to read earlier, but it ties in so perfectly. And this is the book on Marian consecration. And listen to what Father Gately says about uh, this whole sort of ecclesial view of how God works, or this view in which God works through a church in the world. He says, mm -hmm. um, Jesus wants to include all of us in the work of salvation. In other words, he doesn't just redeem us and then expect us to kick back and relax. On the contrary, he puts us to work. He wants all of us to labor in his father's vineyard in one way or another. Why didn't he just snap his fingers and so order things that everyone in the world would individually hear and understand the gospel by some private mystical revelation? We don't know. What we do know is that, and here's the, the key quote, Jesus relies now think of that jesus relies on others to spread his gospel and he commissions his disciples to preach it to all he says to them let's get to work of course that god wants to include us in his work of salvation is a great gift and a glorious privilege so rather than exalting humans above jesus we as Catholics believe that our Father has included all of us in what he is doing through his son Jesus. And that's the language in the New Testament of being a joint heir with Jesus. Not only to receive the benefits of our salvation, we also receive the responsibility uh, to participate with God in bringing that uh, salvation to the world. And Mary is the example par excellence of a, of a Jesus follower who's willing to do that. Good stuff. Amen. Good stuff. All right. As the lightning round continues, this is the slowest lightning round of all time. <laughs> it's so slow. By the way. The oh, amount of stuff we got to cover before this thing is done, but we're rocking and rolling. So how about this? Um, let's talk about Mary and apparitions. Why are we talking about Our Lady of Guadalupe, Our Lady of Lourdes, Our Lady of Fatima? Why is it not Our Lord of Guadalupe? Why doesn't mm -hmm. Jesus appear in Mexico and convert millions of indigenous people while the Spanish stand with their jaws open, right? What is going on with this Mary and the Marian apparitions? <laughs> uh, you know, Matt, I'll, I'll jump in to, to start here with a few uh, big ideas. Um, I can't cover everything re regarding apparitions in the, in the quote lightning round here, but just a few thoughts, okay, just to get people doing their own homework and get you on the trail. First thing I would say regarding apparitions is it's the idea that someone from the heavenly places just pull back from mary for a minute and just think of it this way someone from the heavenly places a saint a holy one um, that person becomes visible to someone in the world someone living in the the world of time space and matter that we live in right now that's the the general idea of an apparition and so we have an example of this happening uh, with Jesus and three of his disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration. An apparition happens, uh, Matthew chapter 17, 1 to 3. I just read the, this text real quick. It says, six days later, Matthew 17, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves, verse 2. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became bright as light. Okay, now, verse 3. Suddenly there appeared to them. Them who? Well, the three guys, Peter, James, and John. There appeared to them Moses 
and Elijah talking with him, that is talking with Jesus. So here's a biblical example in the New Testament of disciples of Jesus being in a place where something supernatural was happening to the degree that there becomes, and I'm going to use some N.T. Wright language here for those who, who like the biblical scholar N.T. Wright, there becomes a thin space, a thin space between heaven and earth, so thin, in fact, that that something becomes visible from the other side on this side and, and vice versa. Uh, there becomes this sort of heaven and earth overlap in a moment of time. So the first thing I would say to the idea of appara uh, apparitions is that the idea itself is firmly biblical. The ecclesiology of a heaven and earth church and the mediation of the Holy Spirit in that heaven and earth church, the communion of saints, indicates that this kind of thing is possible in certain circumstances. So the first thing I would say is the church accepts that, that that's a, a biblical idea. That these saints that show up, Moses and Elijah, for instance, in the case of the Transfiguration, are actually alive because God is the God of the living, not the God of the dead, said Jesus. And so, you know, it would take even a lot more time to cover all the texts in which angelic apparitions happen in the Bible to lots of people. This is a holy one who somehow a thin space is created between heaven and earth, and people can see angels. Even uh, Mary, the, the Virgin Mary, the mother of Jesus, has an, uh, an appearance of an angel, the visitation of an angel to her. Well, so what the church says about apparitions, or let's call them visitations, <laughs> if, if you want something that doesn't sound so Catholic as an apparition, um, that this can happen, period. Now, what about Marian apparitions? Which, by the way, and I can't provide all of the, the, the timeline here, but you can, you can look up the historic timeline of Marian apparitions if you want to do that. The church engages with um, the claims that apparitions have, have occurred because Catholics come to the Catholic Church and say, hey, I had an apparition or a visitation. So the church takes that seriously and investigates these. And there are three basic things that happens when the church investigates an apparition. The first thing that happens, and by the way, there are just basically three judgments or three answers that are, that are made here. The first one is the church will say that they have established this apparition as supernatural. Uh, the Latin word for this is constat de supernatural itate. Not good at Latin. But in other words, the church says, yeah, something very supernatural has happened here. The church, uh, either local or universal, has decided this, this apparition really happened and it's worthy of pious belief. But the second thing the church might say about an apparition, here let's use the Latin, constat de non supernaturalitate. Uh, we have determined that this was not supernatural. <laughs> this was, there's, there's nothing to this. This is a claim that, that is devoid of, of supernatural um, consideration. It, it didn't happen. But then this third one, um, sometimes the church investigating apparitions will say, non constat de supernaturalite, which means we have not established that it is supernatural, which is a way of saying, we'll see. We're still thinking about it. So, to the viewer, I would say not all apparitions are created or treated equally within the Catholic perspective. They're, they're investigated because the church believes they can happen. They happen in the Bible a lot, with uh, especially with angels, sometimes with, with saints. And so we would expect that, that God, whose church is in heaven and on earth, may still have this kind of thing happen in salvation history in which we're participating in right now in the age of the church. So, so far, it can happen, and some have happened and were real. But finally then, what about when Mary in some of these apparitions appears? And, you know, I've heard this, Matt and Ken. In fact, one of my Foursquare pastor friends kind of challenged me. Well, well, Mary, when she appears, sometimes asks people to do things, quote, in her name or on behalf of her, or she's a little self-referential. Why isn't she more referential toward Jesus? To this, I would respond pretty basically with just a couple of, of biblical references, and then I'll let you guys chime in. The first is, you know, even the Apostle Paul, 
for instance, in the letter of Philemon, when he sent um, mm -hmm. Onesimus back to um, his master Philemon, he sent him with a letter. And when when Philemon opens the letter, he reads in verse seventeen, "Receive him as you would receive who Jesus? No, receive Onesimus, Philemon, as you would receive me." <laughs> In other words, Paul is self-referential when he's trying to rebuild the bridge between this, this slave, Onesimus, and his master Philemon. And he says, receive him as you would receive me, because that adds weight to the relationship. It'll help. A second is in 1 Corinthians, where Paul says, you have many teachers, but I alone am your father because I became your father in the faith through, you know, preaching the gospel to me. Paul is taking responsibility for the fact that the Corinthians had received the gospel at all. He's self-referential with respect to how that came about. Even though he says, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified, he still says, I'm participating in how this came about. And then the last one I'll share, and then I need to stop, is 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 3, um, where this church discipline is happening because of an immorality and the church's failure to do anything about it. Listen to how Paul characterizes the ecclesial communion of, of dealing with something um, painful in the church, for instance. He says, for my part, verse 3, 1 Corinthians 5, for my part, even though I am not physically present, I am with you in spirit as one who is present with you in this way. I have already passed judgment in the name of our Lord Jesus on the one who is doing this. In other words, Paul believes in one church, a heaven and earth church, and he believes that the spirit is the mediator in our relationships with each other, and that somehow we have an impact on one another, and sometimes referring to one another in the way that we're doing things adds weight to what's taking place here. I, I just thought of uh, in, in the book of Acts where where Paul stuffs his handkerchief into the hand of someone and says, oh, in a sense, take this and tell him I'm praying for him. You know, um, There is the sense in which we participate very actively in what's going on in other people's lives. So I would just say it doesn't shock me at all for Mary, for instance, in an apparition to say, well, tell him, you know, go, go and say I sent you, you know, just like Paul says, uh, mm -hmm. receive him as you would receive me. It's in other words, it's going to add weight to what's happening here. Let me pause there. I've said a lot, guys. What would you add to what I've, what I've shared? Well, the main, the main thing that's popping into my mind that needs to be said is that the Catholic Church teaches formally that the deposit of faith is what was taught by the apostles right. and uh, you know explicitly, implicitly, what, can, what is applied by what they taught, and that public revelation ended with the death of the last apostle. Right, so, yes. So, so, so the Church teaches that private revelations and private apparitions and revelations and whatnot, even when they are approved for devotion by the Church— the church yeah. also te teaches that no one has to, no one is required to believe in them, or right. required to believe in what was communicated, or you know, which is an interesting thing, and it's an interesting yes. thing that I still think about, you know, yes. that that the church would approve for devotion something, but then say at the same time, look, public revelation ceased with the end of the apostles, and and no dogmatic teaching of the church can be based on anything but that, and so while while the church may approve, it, it holds back in the sense that it says this is not a requirement on anyone. Yeah, I, I, I'm so glad you brought that up, Ken, because I wanted to read from the catechism and didn't get to and don't have it open before me. Maybe one of you guys can look it up when I make this comment. You know, that This is paragraph so-and-so in the catechism res regarding apparitions. But you're right. I mean, as much the church is authoritatively saying this apparitions can happen. Why? Because they happen in the Bible. So that would be as dogmatic as the church would get in terms of binding truth, saying, you know, this is a biblical idea. Mm -hmm. But the church does not bind us to accepting any of the Marian apparitions that have happened as being dogmatic. And no dogma is built out of those. No doctrinal dogma right, is built right. out of those. Rather, they're based on the biblical right. fact 
that there's a heaven and earth church and that that we are in some ways mm -hmm. going to experience a thin space sometimes in our experience in the world. And again, this is like one of the main criteria the church employs uh, when evaluating these apparitions, as you were, you were saying a moment ago, Kenny, is does this line up with what's completely been publicly revealed and we have been told there's not going to be any new information, right? If there's new right. information or something purporting to be new information, that's that's how one of the ways that we know <laughs> we're not listening yeah. to this one. Um, yeah. But let's yeah. go to the next question yeah. in the list here because, um, man, there's just so many of these. Uh, how about the Queen of Heaven? I've gotten this one a number of times. Uh, there's a reference specifically in Jeremiah is the one I'm thinking about, about the Queen of Heaven mm -hmm. as though it's mm -hmm. a very, very bad thing. So if <laughs> Catholics are calling Mary the Queen of Heaven, obviously Catholics uh, know nothing of the book of Jeremiah or have skipped it over or something else is going on. So what do we make of that? <laughs> I'll take that one. Yeah, the, the question that is asked is why in the world would Catholics use terminology when the Bible presents it in such a negative way? And yes, what's being referred to is a passage, Jeremiah 44. And by the way, this I think I can knock this one off very quickly so we can uh, maybe stay within uh, our limits, all right, as we go forward. Okay, it's true that this title, Queen of Heaven, is used of pagan worship in the Old Testament. Jeremiah 44, this is what we read, verses 24 through 26. Jeremiah said to all the people and all the women, hear the word of the Lord, all you of Judah and, or, and in the land of Egypt. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, you and your wives have declared with your mouths and have fulfilled it with your hands, saying, we will surely perform our vows that we have made to burn incense to the queen of heaven and to pour out libations to her. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, all you of Judah who dwell in the land of Egypt. Behold, I have sworn by my great name, says the Lord, that my name shall no more be invoked by the mouth of any man of Judah in all the land of Egypt, saying, as the Lord God lives. Okay, obviously, they're engaged in pagan worship here, offering incense, burning incense to, quote, unquote, the queen of heaven. Okay, the answer to this charge, though, is really pretty simple and straightforward. In the ancient world, kings were given the titles Lord and even Son of God. Kings were referred to as the Son of God. Caesar was the Son of God. Does this mean that those titles, Lord and Son of God, cannot be rightfully applied to Jesus? It, anyone listening would say, obviously, of course not. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 37, the prophet Daniel refers to Nebuchadnezzar, the pagan Babylonian king, as, listen to this, king of kings. <laughs> king of kings. This is the dream. This was the dream. Now I will tell the king its interpretation. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom God of the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power and the might and the glory, and into whose hand he has given wherever they dwell, the sons of men, the beasts of the field, the birds of the air. God has made you ruler over them all. You are the head of gold. Okay, Nebuchadnezzar is referred to by Daniel as the king of kings. Again, does this mean that the title king of kings now is off limits. You know, it's a shady title. It cannot be applied rightfully to Jesus, as it is in Revelation 17, 14, and Revelation 19, 16. And the answer is, of course not. And so, in the same way, this is my argument, in the same way, the fact that there was a pagan goddess referred to in the ancient world as the queen of heaven, probably the Babylonian goddess Ishtar, doesn't mean that the title cannot be applied rightfully to Mary. Arguing, in, in other words, arguing from superficial similarity of words, is this not a good way to argue, okay? Yeah. The similarity of words. It, it, it doesn't tell you enough. Okay, and si since we covered this, um, that is, since we covered the case for Mary being queen mother of the Davidic kingdom inaugurated by her son, the Lord Jesus, since we covered this, that is, we made the case for it in the episode we did on the bodily assumption. I'm not going to repeat it here, except to say this, to simply say there are good biblical reasons for under, bi biblical reasons for understanding Mary in this way. Her son is the king, the messianic king of the Davidic kingdom. She is the king's mother, the queen mother. She appears in Revelation chapter 12, clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head, a crown, a crown of 12 stars. Mary, Mary is rightfully titled Queen of Heaven. And that's my answer to that. 
I only have one thing to add to that since you're talking about right and wrong ways that a title can be used, that there's a title that can be applied to a bad example of something and a title that can be applied to a good of, good example of something. Mm-hmm. Uh, the one that immediately came to mind for me is from Psalm 68. So we know that Baal, Baal, however you want to pronounce him, depending on your what part of America you're from, I'm not sure. Uh, but I always called him Baal. Uh, he was known as the cloud rider. There were these great hymns to Baal. And uh, according to smarter biblical scholars than me, Psalm 68, mm-hmm. there are chunks of it that are basically a riff by the people of Israel on these hymns to Baal as to saying, we know who the real God is. Baal is the cloud rider, right? Mm-hmm. And in Psalm 68, verse uh, this is a verse 5, it says, Sing to God, praise his name, exalt the rider of the clouds. As if to say to these people worshiping Baal, yeah, you you got your cloud rider. We know who the true yeah. and good cloud rider is, right? Yeah, this right. happens all the time in right. the Bible. Um, <laughs> and it happens all the time actually throughout Christian history where you have somebody who is purporting to be something and God says, no, this is the true, the true manifestation of this. Or we take something that you're looking for and we show you what it is a pale reflection of. Um, anybody who celebrates Christmas knows this, by the way or celebrates any kind of these holidays yes. or, yeah. that are connected with other feasts and, and other places. We've baptized them, right? We've taken them in and uh, yeah. and introduced and infused them with Christ, and now they mean something completely different. So, um, yeah. Kenny, anything to add? Because I've got I've got a doozy of a one to basically close out with. Well, we got two all, more. All I, all I would say is bit. just uh, folks who struggle with the whole idea of Queen of Heaven, just go back and listen to the... Um, the episode that we did on, as Ken said, on Mary as the queen mother in the Judahite line of the Davidic kings. And um, that I, yeah. I think there's a lot of material there for that. All right. So you're ready for uh, you're ready for me to put you on full blast here, <laughs> Kenny oh, Burchard? No. Sure. Okay. All right. So let's say somebody's tracking with us so far, but there's this thing that's in the back of their mind, right? It's that you say read the question, just read the question straight through, read it through, straight through. You Catholics <laughs> say go. you don't worship Mary, but, but all these feast days, right? You name your schools after her. You name your hospitals after her. You name your churches after her. You got special prayers for her in the liturgy. You got hymns to her. You got hymns about her. You got her painted on every wall of the church from the Renaissance uh, <laughs> on. You got her all over the place. And my favorite, which is whenever I'm trying to have a reasonable conversation with somebody, someone shows me a picture of some kid in front of a statue of Mary and says, see, this is proof. This is proof. You all worship yeah, just, Mary. Just, so just, just admit that you worship Mary. Just admit so just it. answer it all. Answer it all, Kenny. Well, let me start with, um, you know, back to pre-Catholic Kenny here. I remember um, going down this litany of, of things that you just listed, Matt, in one of my sermons and saying to Catholics in our church who were in attendance with their spouses or with their families, come on, Catholics, admit it. It's worship. Catholics worship Mary. Those words came flying out of my mouth in a sermon from the pulpit that I stood at as the pastor of our church, a charge that Catholics worship Mary. And what I was doing there was a mistake. What I was doing was a, a mistaken attribution or false attribution or conflating one thing with something that it has no business being conflated with. Any Catholic who understands his or her faith, who hears you tell them that they worship Mary, will bristle under that accusation because it is forbidden, 100% forbidden for mm-hmm. any Catholic to worship anyone other than God. It is the express teaching of yes. the Catholic Church that God alone is worthy and deserves to be worshipped. And then to worship any creature. And, and Mary is a creature. That's uh, archaic language for a creation of God. Mary is not the honorary fourth member of the Trinity. The, the Catholic Church doesn't mm-hmm. teach that. Mary is a creation. She's created by God, and so it is forbidden in Scripture, and it is forbidden in Catholic teaching for any Catholic to worship Mary. Okay, now having said that, then we have to deal with all of these practical observations that you made. Well, then what is it that you're doing if you refuse to use the word worship to describe it? 
And I would say what we're doing is honoring people, honoring Mary. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's hard with the semantic uh, range of words that we use. You know, worship um, is the word that people would, would grab onto when they would, would see you, for instance, kneeling or putting roses in front of, you know, somebody's picture or, or even praying or, or singing a song with the person's name in it. But I would just say, wait a second, slow down and step back a minute and just take a look at the world around you. I mean, we just had the death of the Queen of England, and we heard God save the Queen. We, we saw people putting flowers in front of her picture, uh, huge displays of uh, photographs of her and pictures and letters written uh, to her, uh, lining the streets of, of England. I mean, thousands and thousands of people coming out. And if you told those people that were doing all that in respect and honor for the reign of Queen Elizabeth, that they were worshiping her, they would have said, you're crazy. You have no idea what you're talking about. We're honoring her for who she really is, who she really has been and what she has meant to our nation and to our world. Um, in our culture uh, here in the United States, Matt, you and I don't live far from Washington, D.C. We can go and see, um, you know, lots and lots of things in D.C., huge statues of President Lincoln, people <laughs> kneeling in front of war memorials, putting flowers everywhere. We never think that people are worshiping those folks when they are paying the respect and honor that is due to them. Um, to them. But somehow, again, pro talking to Protestant Kenny here, I'll say, Protestant Kenny, somehow it's your reflex, isn't it, to just attribute the worst motives to Catholics for doing the <laughs> same thing that you do when you visit your grandma's grave. <laughs> Put flowers on it, stand and pray, kneel, cry, you know, mm -hmm. all those kinds of things. What, what I would ask my pre-Catholic self, what, it, what accounts for that need to do that pre-Catholic Kenny? Why not let Catholics explain it to you on their own terms? They are not worshiping Mary. Yeah, Very I'll uh, I'll I'll just go a little further. You know, the litany of things you you said included things like feast days to Mary. Well, we got a feast of George Washington and Abraham Lincoln in February. We got a yeah. feast of Martin Luther King on the secular calendar, right? Exactly. In January, right? How about parishes, schools, and institutions named after Mary? I. Every town's got a hundred things named for random people that have either lived there or, you know, been war heroes. Every bridge that you drive over is named after probably somebody who was, uh, you know, a police officer or a, a soldier killed in combat. I mean, we, we right. do this yeah. sort of thing all the time, right? We have songs about, you know, Davy Crockett, <laughs> right? Is well, that how about happy Davy birthday Crockett? to you, happy birthday, dear Matt? I mean, if we can't sing right. somebody's name... In a song, um, in honor of some important th there's day. There's other then. stuff, but you know, this is a, it's a it's a Marian reflex. But just to kind of tie it back to the whole Marian reflex of, about some of these titles that are given her or ways that we talk about her. So, say for instance, if I were to say Mary is the temple of the Holy Spirit, Mary is the aroma of Christ, uh, Mary is the dwelling place of God, Mary is steward of the mysteries of God. If you bristle at that. Just realize those are all terms that Paul uses either for himself or for all Christians. <laughs> right, I love right. it. I love like, it. Like, right. if Paul That's says good. those things about himself, you're fine, right? Right. If someone says that about Mary, something about they're, Mary that Paul says Mary is true of all Christians, they're idolaters. and you flinch, right. that says something. Right. So, yeah, very good. The only, thing, the only thing I can think to add to all this is that, Matt, you're, when you mentioned the feast to, day to... Abraham Lincoln and to George Washington, you're forgetting we live in the era in which everyone gets a gold star. That's been changed <laughs> now. It's President's Day. All of the presidents are just as good as one another. Now, hang on a second. All Let me just add something right here. Praise. Okay, I know we call so, it President's Day. And I know we call it during December, we call it the holidays. But we all know whose birthday it really is. The it's George. Okay, let's go on to number seven. Yeah. Let's go on to number seven. All right. All right. Let's have Number mercy. Seven. Let's have mercy on our listeners. Number seven. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's say you are not tracking with every single thing we just said, but you really want to become Catholic, but you're hung up somewhere. 
can you still become Catholic if you're hung up on a little piece of something about Mary? Because I know that's a big question burning in a lot of people's hearts who have been following us through this. This is a good question, and this is a question that I have received. That is, can I become a Catholic if I don't believe all of the things that the Catholic Church teaches about Mary? But it could be something else, too. And, and, And again, I think that I can at least throw this out very, very quickly, the basic answer. This is one that I had someone struggle with um, mightily and, and present this. Okay, I never encourage someone to become Catholic if they are definitely settled on the fact that some formal ca- teaching of the Catholic Church is false. If they say, no, you know, I've thought it through and it's false, then I can't encourage someone to become a Catholic because it is true that when you become Catholic, you are saying, in fact, I believe the question is asked to you when you are received into the Church— do you accept as true all that the Catholic Church presents as true? Do you do you accept it? Do you so so I cannot encourage someone to become Catholic who believes half the doctrines or believes three quarters of them and definitely is opposed to them. On the other hand, here's how I put it with with those who have asked the question to me, and I've received this on good authority. Um, if you are willing to say the following, you can become Catholic. Let's say your issue is and this is quite often the case, let's say your issue is you believe in the Catholic Church and you believe in the doctrines, the dogmas of the Catholic Church, but you just can't buy the bodily assumption of Mary or something like that. Here's how I put it with people. If you are willing to say the following, you can become Catholic. That is this. One, I am not sure I understand this teaching correctly. Two, if I do understand this teaching correctly, I cannot see at this point how it can be true. Three, nevertheless, I'm willing to trust that the church over the course of 2,000 years might have a better insight into things than I do. And then fourth, therefore, I am willing to accept the teaching even though I do not fully understand it, do not understand how it could be true. I'm willing to accept this teaching and trust that given enough time prayer and study, I will understand more fully. Which I can summarize as this, if you're willing to approach, because the bottom line is you don't become a Catholic if you don't believe that the Catholic Church is the church founded by Christ and the apostles, the church that the Holy Spirit has led through the ages. And so if you are willing to simply approach with humility and say, let's say on the doctrine of the bodily assumption, you know, I'm not sure I understand it correctly, okay? I'm willing to say that, but I kind of think I do understand it correctly, and if I do understand it correctly, for the life of me, I can't understand how this could be true at this point. But I am willing to trust that the church, over 2,000 years, might have better insight into things than I do, and <clears throat> and might be able to draw out the implications of, of the faith better than I can, and therefore, I am willing to trust that the church is right and I'm willing to enter the trust. I mean, I'm enter the church trusting that and trusting that given more time, more study, more learning, I can come to understand this and receive it more fully. That's really what you need to be able to say to become Catholic. If you can't say that, I can't encourage you to become Catholic. So this Sounds is going to sound maybe, I don't know. This is going to sound bonkers, but I was <clears throat> somewhat in that gray zone when I bit the bullet, right? When I made the plunge. And I'm going to say something that might make zero sense to a person who is trying to figure this out step by step. But in a lot of ways, the grace I needed to believe some of the things that I was having trouble with came when I basically said, God, I'm going to trust you and go through with this. Suddenly there were a lot of stuff that like, maybe I had the intellectual arguments for before, but I didn't have kind of like the Mm -hmm. grace piece or the the head and the heart connection piece. Uh, But once I made that move, there were all kinds of things that sort of, I breathe a bit of a sigh of relief on because it wasn't this massive fight anymore. It was like, Christ, I know I'm in your church. Mm -hmm. We'll figure this out. Yeah. So, Yeah, I use the phrase, guys, this will be my last contribution to our discussion here, but I used a phrase on the, you know, when I knew that I had to become Catholic and I just didn't get everything and everything hadn't settled down in my brain and didn't all make Mm -hmm. sense. I embraced this posture and this phrase and this idea that I would, and here it goes, I would stand under the authority of the Church of Jesus until I 
understand things better. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, I accepted the possibility that I could be wrong and had put lots of things together in the wrong way. Nobody wants to be wrong about what they believe. Um, but I had to accept the possibility that I could have been and that, that I probably was about things. So I said, I will stand under until I understand. And that really helped me in terms of my posture. And then, and then it's a journey because even when I wasn't a Catholic, I didn't understand everything Christians believe. That's a journey that you come to. And I've changed my mind about a lot of things, you know, since I've become a Christian. Any honest person watching this, Catholic or not, would have to admit you've done the same thing. I'm going to close with this. When I think about it, when I was a Bible only Protestant, I didn't understand everything that was in the Bible, you know, but. I didn't say to myself, you know what, until I can exegete every verse in the entire Bible and it all right. makes sense to me and I've answered every potential problem, I'm not going to be a Christian. Uh, you know, I submitted myself to the authority of Scripture, believing that it was the inspired Word of God and, and, and leaving it open. I will learn as I go. And when I was becoming Catholic, it wasn't that I was functioning as a Protestant and saying, I'm going to work through every doctrinal issue, and once it is satisfactorily proved to me, then I will become Catholic. There was actually a point where I was saying to myself, you know what, that's what I don't want to do anymore. I don't want to be the right. person who decides everything on earth. Right. So I'm going to, the way I've said it in the past, I'm going to take my seat in the pew next to Ignatius of Antioch and Ambrose of Milan and St. Augustine of Hippo. I'm going to take my seat in the pew, and I'm going to become a learner in the Church yeah. of Christ. And so... This is sort of how I how I view it, and uh, this is how I answer people. Anyway, that's it for that. It's a good word, man. It's a good word. A lot of good words. A lot of main words that were uh, repeated, but not vainly. Right? <laughs> Themes that recurred. At any rate... There was no vain I, repetition going on no in vain this repetition. episode. <laughs> um, but if you want to repeat this episode, uh, by all means, uh, go back and do so. If you want to go and find this, some of the context or some of the things that we were talking about, we mentioned the Queen of Heaven episode. That's the Assumption episode uh, a couple back. There's a lot of stuff that maybe, if you, if this is the first episode of these that you, you're catching, definitely go back and watch the other Mary stuff. I, I hope that'll make it make a lot more sense. And you can do so by going to chnetwork.org. Uh, if you're on a journey right now and working through these questions and just want to talk to somebody, uh, we have a whole community of people who are doing what you're doing or have been through stages that you're going through now community.chnetwork.org is where you can plug in to that and uh, meet a lot of other people like yourselves uh ken and kenny and i are all in there too and then finally if you want to give to support our work so we can continue to have these conversations and make them available to as many people as possible um who are looking for this kind of help then go to chnetwork.org slash donate ken hensley kenny burchard thank you again so great thank to be you. with you guys today. And we'll thank you. you for watching this episode of On the Journey with Matt and Ken and Kenny. I'm Matt Swaim, and we'll talk to you next time around.